Hi, I'm Nancy Florine, an at-large member of the Montgomery County Council. I'd like to invite you to join me for a conversation with Congressman Chris Van Hollen. That's coming up next, right here on County Cable Montgomery. On this show, No Boundaries travels to the Black Market Bistro in Garrett Park. While staff prepared for the lunch crowd, Nancy Florine, an at-large member to the Montgomery County Council, and Congressman Chris Van Hollen, who represents Maryland's 8th District in the U.S. House of Representatives, shared their perspectives, discussed common concerns, and looked to the future. They began by talking about the restaurant, a centerpiece to the neighborhood where Council Member Florine resides. Uh, welcome. It's great to be here. And thanks for having <laughs> us at the Black Market Bistro. Oh, I know yeah. you worked very hard to uh, help renovate this area and even bring this restaurant here. How'd that happen? Well, you know, this is a really important place to me, this whole building. Uh, when I was mayor of Garrett Park, uh, I led the charge to really renovate this whole building. And uh, we had a real challenge in terms of uh, uh, accessibility for our elderly residents. And we have our post office downstairs, you may recall. That's right, right, yeah. Uh, town office is upstairs. And the post office, as you may recall, was threatening to leave. Yes, I do <laughs> remember very well. <laughs> so this whole building is a real community center for Garrett Park. So we went through the whole shebang, you know, community debate. We had a referendum. Everyone argued about everything. At the end of the day, we came together and we renovated this great historic building. It's on the National Register. Uh, the blacks, mm -hmm. who at the time were town residents in Garrett Park, agreed to be part of this effort, added the kitchen, at an expense the town certainly couldn't afford, and have been great tenants here. It's been really neat to see them do so well in the Washington region. Yeah, well, it's you know. a great spot. I mean, I know every time I try and just drop by here without a reservation, it's packed. So yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's yeah. a great spot. You definitely. know, we have these little moments in our lives that, uh, that make us feel good. And I always feel good when I drive into town and see, you know, we did this as a Absolutely. community. Everybody chipped in. You know, we have all kinds of experts here uh, who contributed for free their services, uh, leasing, uh, historic preservation, all that stuff, and made this happen. And it's a real statement of the kind of community we have in Montgomery County. It's true. So how did you uh, end up in Kensington? Well, that's a long story, <laughs> but I'll try and uh, I'll, I'll try and short cut it a little bit. You know, my dad was from Baltimore originally. My dad's family grew up in Baltimore. Then he decided to go into the Foreign Service. Uh, and so I grew up many of my early years overseas. I was actually born in Karachi, Pakistan. Uh, we lived in Turkey and India and Sri Lanka, going back and forth. Um, and uh, my mom, uh, when my dad retired from the Foreign Service, she got involved in foreign policy issues at the State Department uh, as well. Uh, but uh, because my, I had Maryland roots originally, when we finally did come back and I graduated from college, uh, I decided to, you know, come back home to Maryland. And I you know, went to uh, Georgetown Law School uh, at night and ended up working on the Hill uh, for a fellow by the name of Senator Mac Mathias, uh, who was from Maryland, Maryland yeah. of course, a Maryland uh, senator. And I was doing foreign policy and national security work for Mac Mathias. Uh, and after a while, I went to work for Governor Schaefer. Uh, and, you know, then I got more and more interested in in local issues. I had kids. I was interested in the school system uh, in Montgomery County, and all three of our kids went through that Montgomery County public school system. But that, that got me more and more interested in local politics. So here's my question. Mm -hmm. So you were born in Pakistan, yes, right? Indeed. So does that mean you can't run for president? Well, you know, we have people <laughs> burning the midnight oil on this to try and uh, get an answer. but. Um, uh, actually, I, you know, I don't have any plans to, I'm not making an answer, know, but no, know, but, but, um, but, but seriously, I, yes, the answer is yeah. I mean, John McCain, as you know, was, you know, he was like born in the Panama yeah. Canal area. I think Ted Cruz was born in Canada. So I don't think they're, you know, I, they're you know, a bit I we, we haven't been, we haven't been spending <laughs> sleepless nights worrying about it, but uh, you know, I don't, uh, when I make the announcement, I'll, yeah. You know, but I, what, what, what's propelled you into uh, this? Well, you know, uh, really, uh, we've been friends for a long time. Yes, we have. And uh, I will tell you one of the reasons, well, one thing that 
propelled me into running for the county council years ago, and mm -hmm. I hadn't really thought about it at the time, was uh, it was when you were running for Congress. Yeah. And uh, I have to tell you, I had a, had a little event for you at my house. That was the first time ever. I remember that. And I thought, oh, you can do this. <laughs> Boy, we're taking ourselves back a little ways. You know, you, just like I started out in the sort of state legislature, um, you, I think you were on, you were, I know you were on the planning board. Yeah. I mean, that's where yeah. you really sort of got into the nitty gritty of trying to put together, you know, well, arrangements we are, like this. Well, there's always something yeah. that propels you. So you really have always been in politics one way or the other. Well, Is I spent a right? lot of time as a, a lawyer. So I went to uh, Georgetown Law School. When I got out of uh, actually before law school, I actually spent a lot of time doing foreign policy uh, and national security issues. So I used to do arms control uh, issues uh, during, the, during the Cold War. When I was at college, I got, you know, as many people of that generation, very worried about uh, the possibility of nuclear war. And so I spent a lot of time doing that. I then went to law school and practiced law for about 10 years partly overlapping with my time in the, in the state legislature. What is it that uh, triggered your, your run for politics? Was it the schools? I mean, to get into the legislature, was it school issues? It was partly. It was school issues, environmental issues, um, a whole range of local issues that I got interested in uh, at that time. And, you know, I'd been working on the Hill, so I was mm -hmm. interested in public policy issues. Uh, and then I'd worked for Governor Schaefer. So I went from Capitol Hill to work in Governor Schaefer's Washington office, and I got very involved in Maryland uh, issues when I was in the governor's Washington office. And so it was natural in many ways, having been working on lots of those issues for Governor Schaefer, whose motto was do it now, uh, you know, fill that pothole when you see the pothole. He had a very good hands-on management uh, st you know, strategy. He could be, you know, a little crazy, uh, but in a good way. No, a good way. We used to say in the Washington office, the good news was we were out of, out of you know, range for flying sharp objects. Um, but I will say he, he did instill in his whole team a sense of urgency, you know, don't, don't just say when someone calls, oh, we'll look into it and get back to you, you know, a couple months. Do it now is his motto. And um, I think that's good advice for people. Well, you know, I think uh, Governor Schaefer really uh, taught a us a lot about leadership. Mm. Yes, he did. How you, you you own the stage on a particular issue. Uh, I, I free, were you working for him at that time? He was, I think he put on a swimsuit and went down the right. slide in the Baltimore Aquarium or yeah. something like that. No, that's that, exactly right. Well, I was not working for him. I was working for him when he was governor. But when he was mayor of Baltimore, mayor, you're right, he made yeah. national news and drew attention to Baltimore by, in a little, you know, full body, little swimsuit, jumped into the National Aquarium. And, you know, he, he is, you know, partly responsible for the, the renaissance of Baltimore, and there are lots of things, and, and Baltimore still continues to need, you know, lots of investment. But um, very different styles. I also worked, as I said, for uh, Senator Mathias, who is an incredibly thoughtful uh, person and, you know, always tried to think through every side of an issue uh, and was very well respected on Capitol Hill. I know you, I mean, you, you've worked for people in politics before you jumped into politics. Well, I did. I did work uh, for a while for Senator Mikulski. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had such a great opportunity to learn from people mm -hmm. uh, the, about how you uh, address issues, mm -hmm. uh, the details of speaking to an audience, how you get a sense of the room, you know. Yeah and uh, communicate to everyone in a, in a way that's really meaningful. That's one thing that Senator Mikulski is brilliant at. And certainly uh, Governor Mayor Schaefer uh, really won the prize for uh, capturing the public um, uh, perception and really uh, helping to convey an understanding of whatever it was that the issue is. It's, right. an, it's an interesting stage we're on. This is why you took a second job. Why you taught yourself how to fix the plumbing. Why you'll do whatever it takes to keep your home. And that is why we want to help. We are making home affordable, a free government resource that can make paying the mortgage easier. Call 888-995-HOPE today.
From Black Market Bistro in Garrett Park, the conversation continues between County Council Member Nancy Florine and Congressman Chris Van Hollen. They began this segment by reflecting on the people who inspired them to turn to political office. My experience growing up overseas yeah. really shaped the way I, I look at the world, and uh, that really came from my mom and my dad. You know, when you live overseas and represent the United States overseas, as my, my dad and mom did, you, you need to do two things. You need to really understand the, the people and the cultures you're, you're living among, right? So my mom, um, while she wasn't in the Foreign Service herself at that time, she learned to speak three or four languages. No. Um, and when she, my dad retired, she ended up going to work at the State Department and putting you know, that talent. Uh, to use. Uh, the other thing, of course, you have to do is, is represent the United States and the values of the, of the United States. And, you know, my dad grew up in a family that um, they were big FDR fans and family. They believed in the, the value of public service. Um, they believe strongly that in this country, every individual has to pursue his or her own dreams. But they also believe in the idea that there are some things we do better as a community, as family, right? We need to make sure everybody has an opportunity to go to college. My dad uh, was, took advantage of the GI Bill. Um, and so those kind of things, seeing that there is a positive role for government when it's working well, um, is what sort of propelled me over time. Uh, and, and, you know, the fact that I was proud of, you know, representing the United States overseas as part of that family, but also getting a sense of the perspective of other people mm -hmm. in the world. It does help you listen better, I think, and, um, and you know, you've also. I certainly never expected to be in politics or even as involved in public policy as I am. I'm kind of an accidental yeah. to a politician to a certain degree, uh, but uh, I got involved in local land use issues years ago and was appointed to the County Planning Commission, and I was really lucky. I had a mentor in uh, Norman Chris Deller, who was the chair of the Planning Commission right. at that point. And he w was a real presence, uh, particularly on the issue of affordable housing. And right. he's the kind of guy he'd go and bang the table with his shoe over something that he felt was not right. Yep. And it, he really taught me um, about the importance of sticking to your guns on mm -hmm. important issues and pushing. Yeah. and never, never giving up on things that you think are important, particularly the people who can't speak for themselves. Yeah. There are a lot of people that we hear from who are really good at speaking yeah. for themselves. Sure. Sure. But it's, it's, the, it's the folks who are not at the table, I think, uh, that need to be uh, represented in a way uh, that, that gets them where they need to go. And it's not about getting support from that particular constituency. It's about doing the right thing. And that's right. something Norman taught me a lot about and mm -hmm. uh, really has, has helped me stick to my convictions yeah. when it would be a lot easier to say, oh, whatever. Right. Uh, it's more, it's har much harder to do the right thing um, uh, in the face of a lot of opposition. No, I think that's a really good lesson, which is that um, you know, sometimes you have an issue where in the heat of the moment the crowd is all headed in one way. And, you know, people might say, well, it's the job of elected officials just to, you know, reflect the crowd. And that is where I think, you know, leadership does come in. I think it's important to say, look, um, here's what you may think right now, but let's just take a step back and, and, and listen. I have to say what you're saying about listening, I think, is so important. Uh, if you really, really listen to peop what people are saying, uh, oftentimes it, they're not really opposing things, they're raising issues, mm -hmm. uh, concerns that need to be validated, yeah. uh, but not necessarily, uh, well, if you can do that, you can help them uh, move along as well, right. and it's a really important skill. Right, no, I think, you know, in, in politics, I think you need to be able to do two things. One, you need to be able to listen carefully, right, uh, to our constituents. I mean, there are some people who spend all their time just talking and not listening, um, so you need to do that. But you also need to be willing to, you know, get out there on issues and lead. You want to both reflect the views and values of your constituents, but you also, in some cases, it's your responsibility to say, you know, here are the facts as I understand them. I'm exercising my best judgment and, and, and leading the way on some issues. So that's, it's a, you know, it's the same uh, whether you're, you know, 
you know, in national politics, state politics, local politics, mayor, Congress. It's um, and they all it's it's all like that. The other thing I think people need to realize is they can really make a difference. I mean, persistence <laughs> is really important. Um, you know, when I was at Swarthmore College, I got involved with something called the Swarthmore Anti-Apartheid Committee, which was uh -huh. pushing the college to divest from companies that were doing business in South Africa. That movement um, took a long time to succeed, but ultimately, through that grassroots effort around the country, uh, it moved because later I was a staff member on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee for Senator Mathias. At the time that the Senate finally imposed economic sanctions against the apartheid racist regime in South Africa. Um, it was years after the student movement had began, but that constant pressure and momentum finally broke through. And there was a real example of leadership there too, because Senator Luger, who is a Republican senator from Indiana, led the way to pass the South Africa sanctions legislation in the face of opposition from President Reagan, who was a mm, member of his own party. Yeah. President Reagan vetoed that legislation. Senator Luger helped overturn the president's veto on a major foreign policy issue. So it was an example of seeing how the system worked through grassroots effort and then into the political system, and then an example of um, leadership from members of Congress. Well. Everybody has a dream. Mine was to see the ocean. And with a little help, I made it. In this final segment of No Boundaries from the Black Market Bistro in Garrett Park, Congressman Van Hollen and Councilmember Florine started off by discussing the challenges of balancing work and family. I know, you know, you had three, you have three children, and I have three children. I mean, how did you balance all that? Well, it's, it's been an interesting challenge. Um, when I got into, um, uh, became a member of the planning board, I, my children were young, uh, but there was, I did not work full time at this, so I was able to make it all work out. And by the time I really got into uh, what I'm doing now, they were pretty much out of the home. I will say the biggest challenge I think uh, ends up just how you deal with your spouse. Uh, you're not home a lot. Uh, there are things you miss or you have to, co it's hard to coordinate and it's a, a challenge. Now your kids have, uh, You've had them and they've grown up all this time while you've been in public office. You're an empty nester now. Yes, just but, this year. But just now. That's right. So uh, how have you handled well, that? Well, it's, you know, <laughs> it, it's a lot of juggling. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Uh, we know that I am lucky because most of my colleagues in Congress, right, they have to get on an airplane and go home. Yeah. Um, every weekend thousands of miles away sometimes and then they then when they go home they've got to be balancing between family and constituents where being close by has has huge benefits and you know they're a little jealous of the fact that I can get in the car every morning and, and commute to work and come home every day now that that means that uh, I get to see my constituents all the time and on Capitol Hill which is a, a good thing mm -hmm. um, but it also meant with with the kids I was able to you know be home and around for many more of their activities. Um, when I first ran in 1990 for the state legislature, that was the, you know, my daughter was born just before the primary, just a few mm. weeks. So, I mean, they have grown up um, sort of with me in public service. And, you know, in the early days, I think they loved the parades. I think as they, they got a little older, it was like, okay, dad. No, no. But, but they are still very supportive. And, you know, I was able to coach both my boys' soccer teams. I mean, and that was a, a great experience. And I remember you know, driving from some official duty and then pulling over to the side of the road and changing into my soccer coach <laughs> clothes. Hopefully nobody was driving by at the time and um, going on to, on to soccer practice. So, you know, you, you, you try and make it work. And, you know, my wife, Catherine, has been a great partner. And so it's, it's been, it, it's worked. I mean, every <laughs> once in a while you feel like you're dropping something here or there. But, um, 
Uh, and it is, it is a tough balancing act. But So your challenge is uh, you're never very far away from your constituents. I mean, well, that's I, true. I, I bought you into too, that, right? too. I mean, that's a, uh. Yeah. Uh, you know, the one challenge in this area is since we're right in the backyard of the nation's capital, you always find constituents who know a lot more about a particular issue you're working on than you do. I mean, you don't want to argue with the person, uh, you know, about how a federal government program is structured when they founded the program uh, some time back, whereas, uh, you know, I think sometimes my staff wishes I wish represented a district you know, thousands of miles away where, where people were not as aware. But, but that, it comes with a great benefit. I mean, I get lots of good ideas and suggestions from people in this community. Well, you know, we see that certainly at the county council level. Uh, yes. Uh, because we represent such an educated community, and they are exactly. very engaged, yes. and oftentimes they've run the agency. We had someone who worked for go. EPA last night testifying in front of us about pesticides. Uh, it's really easy to get expert uh, opinion, and sometimes it is opinion, mm -hmm. uh, but it's really easy to get uh, some of the best and brightest to contribute to the formulation of whatever it is that's that's before us. And Absolutely. I really think it helps us do a better job. Absolutely. No, I think, I mean, as you say, we've got a, a very engaged, very educated uh, constituency. And, you know, they, they, they participate as they should. You know, interestingly, the, my, the area you represent, Montgomery County, has more people than the congressional district I represent, right? Because Four hundred Montgomery, thousand more. Yeah, and so <laughs> um, we both have to, you know, travel uh, to see all parts of our, our district. I mean, I got to go to the Pennsylvania border, but you've got to go out to all corners of uh, Montgomery County, uh, and so it's a lot of territory to cover. And very different people. Yeah. You know, uh, I'm sure it's the same for you. The people in Damascus are very different from the people in Long Branch and Bethesda and Olney, I mean, it's, it's a real mix. And, and your district is, well, a bit gerrymandered, uh, one would oh, say. Yeah, it I mean, reflects the, yeah. such different views all the way up to Pennsylvania and down to, to uh, Bethesda and Silver Spring. I mean, that's a you lot of What's interesting, difference. I find, is look, everybody has the same goals largely, right? They want to make sure their kids have a good education. They want to make sure we have a transportation system that allows people to get to and from work and, you know, with, be with their kids. So the goals people have, the end goals, are largely the same. There are, of course, major disagreements over the best way to achieve those goals, and that's what makes it exciting. I mean, I have had town halls uh, sometimes that, you know, get pretty boisterous. <laughs> but you know what? That's the way the, the system works. That's, that's democracy. It, it, it truly is. And one of the blessings that we have, at least with you, uh, is that we can work together on that's right. issues. Oftentimes, uh, constituents will come to us with an issue that's really a federal issue. Yeah. And you and your office have been tremendous in helping us help our constituents navigate uh, through uh, the matter that's really on their minds. And that, yeah. that makes a big difference. That's right. And there's also there are areas of obvious overlap. I mean, you, you headed the transportation yeah. subcommittee on the county council for a long time, and we worked together on those issues because there's obviously a county component transportation, a state road and transportation system, and, and federal. I mean, right now we're dealing with uh, Wilmot, and of course we had this terrible uh, accident uh, the other day in Wilmot, and there was another one several years ago. So that's an area where we're all uh, very involved. At the federal level, you know, the Congress provides $150 million to the WMATA system every year on top of the regular formula funding. And, and the members of the delegation from the Washington area pushed for that a number of years ago, arguing that WMATA was not just a local metro system, it's the nation's uh, metro system. Uh, and so, you know, with that federal money comes an important federal oversight uh, responsibility. So we're going to be calling in the National you know, Transportation Safety Board and all the WMATA officials. and. Uh, get a readout on what, what happened because we always need to use these, uh, you know, these tragedies to try and make sure they don't happen again. Um, what are we going to do about some of these big picture problems like transportation funding? You know, right. I've been having the same conversation now for 12 years about how we're going to fund our infrastructure, how the feds are going to contribute, yep. how we're going to make these things happen. And at the end of the day, it seems like everyone comes, well, 
uh, federal leadership come up, comes up with the idea that, well, you locals sh need to find a way. Well, I'm glad you raised the Federal <laughs> Transportation Trust Fund because actually uh, on the very opening day of this Congress, uh, I put forward a proposal on opening day uh, for a vote um, because the Federal Transportation Trust Fund is going to start going insolvent in May, just a few uh -huh. months from now, meaning the revenue coming in from the gas tax will not be sufficient to support the ongoing programs. And so what I proposed was uh, we should end these corporate tax loopholes. They're called corporate inversions. Right. You have a lot of big companies that now are simply changing their address from the United States to someplace overseas. They got a lot of good lawyers, fancy lawyers, to change this. And as a result, they don't pay their taxes to the United States anymore, even though they benefit from all the services provided by the United States. So simply by closing that corporate inversion loophole, we would at least be able to fund the transportation trust fund fully for two years. Now, we need an even longer term solution and we put forward some ideas to do exactly that. Uh, unfortunately, they haven't gotten traction in Congress yet, but we're, we're, gonna, keep, we're gonna keep pushing. I mean, I, we also see some moves to try and dramatically cut the federal investment in places like the National Institutes of Health and other scientific research, uh, as well as in education, which would be a huge mistake and, and be shortchanging our future in terms of opportunity and the economy, as you know, because you know this medical research and other research has great benefits for the economy. Yeah, I, uh, these are all very significant issues for Montgomery County. Of course, we're the ho host to so many federal agencies. Uh, so many of mm -hmm. our residents are right. um, employees or contractors with the federal government. And certainly we are seeing, I think, uh, and I think collectively the state believes the, the results, long-term results of some of the sequestration uh, decisions. We have a new governor who's pledged to cut taxes. I think they're re reviewing the bidding uh, about uh, what's essential in government, but the fact remains. I mean, I've, I've been doing this budgeting uh, bookkeeping right. for some time, as you have, and uh, you know, at a certain point, there's just so far, you, there's so many fixed expenses just in terms of, of, of delivering very basic services that, that are inescapable. Well, that's right. I mean, obviously, government has a responsibility to make sure that we spend the money wisely, and we need to be constantly looking for ways to you know, change the way we do business and modernize the business. But at some point, you know, when you start cutting significantly, you're cutting into the, into the bone. Yeah. And um, that's true whether you're talking about education, it's true whether you're talking about uh, funding research at Nash, the National Institutes of Health. I mean, there are real consequences to not funding research in areas like cancer or diabetes. It means that a lot of people around the country uh, who otherwise would be doing research and getting grants that might one day bring about a cure um, or treatment for one of those diseases is canceled. Um, and not only does that mean, you know, less people get the sort of health care that they need, it's also bad for the economy because the spin-off benefits from those investments have been just huge. So it's very short-sighted to cut some of those really important uh, investments. Uh, we also, of course, need a tax system, though, that, that you know, is fair and grows the economy. And we, um, there are a lot of people feeling squeezed now around the country, and so we need to look for uh, ways to address those issues. And that's one of the things I'm very focused on now. Well, it's going to be uh, an interesting stretch, that's for sure, uh, both for you and for us at the local and state level, finding a way to deliver the services that our residents expect without burdening them unduly with all these extra taxes and fees. So uh, I'm sure we'll find a solution uh, shortly. I look forward to continuing <laughs> to work with you, Nancy. And we'll, we'll continue right. to talk. Thanks for right. so much for coming over, Chris. It's great to be with you.